I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, tech's most valuable unicorn hints at an IPO. We'll break down the game plan for Uber after the new boss meets the troops for the first time. Plus, a Bloomberg scoop. Apple goes all in on the touchscreen and the home button becomes a thing of the past as the countdown to the next big iPhone event begins. We have the inside track on the biggest design changes in iPhone history. And Warren Buffett sounds off on tech. Berkshire Hathaway chairman and CEO speaks to Bloomberg TV. We cover his biggest regrets in the tech industry and what industries are still ripe for disruption. But first, to our lead. The world's most valuable startup could be going public sooner than we think. Incoming Uber CEO Darakos Rashahi met with Uber employees Wednesday and said he thinks the company should go public in the eight next 18 to 36 months. He also outlined some of his top priorities on the job, including coming up with a new set of core values and bringing in a new chairman to help drive the agenda. Uber's comms team tweeted out some of Khosrow Shahi's remarks at the staff meeting saying, this company has to change. What got us here is not what's going to get us to the next level. In addition, to talking to employees, the CEO and Khosrow Shahi will get likely, excuse me, he will likely get a seat on the board opposite Uber CEO, former CEO and co-founder Travis Kalanick. Meantime, Kalanick has already expressed interest in returning to a more active role at the company since he was ousted in June, creating a potentially more awkward dynamic that Khosrow Shahi will need to manage. In the meantime, it was all smiles at the first meet and greet as Uber board member Ariana Huffington shared this selfie showing the changing of the guard at the ride hailing company. Joining us now here in the studio, our Bloomberg tech reporter, Eric Newcomer, who of course covers all things Uber, and Bloomberg's global head of tech coverage, Brad Stone, who wrote The Upstarts, a book about Uber's humble beginnings. All right, so he spoke to employees today. What did he have to say? I mean, it was sort of uh, some jokes, you know, celebrating Travis's role at the company, saying some of, you know, what got them to this point isn't what's gonna get them ahead, and then obviously, uh, this conversation about the IPO. I don't know, 18 to 36 months seems pretty far to me, so it's a distant thing with lots of hurdles in the interim. But I mean, this is a guy, uh, Kosra Shahi, who ran a public company for, for a long time, so he understands and said the importance of going public at some point. Brad, what do you make of the show of camaraderie, the all smiles, the hugs? Yeah, exactly. I think it wasn't just what was said, but how it was said, right? This was a show of unity. Ryan Graves, uh, you know, one of the Uber co-founders, the first CEO introduced the proceedings. Travis was there shedding tears, introducing Dara. Um, you know, Ariana, other board members were there. Obviously, perhaps not everyone on that uh, very contentious board, but, you know, there was a message Sent, sent to employees, probably to drivers, and definitely to the to the media and to customers that they're trying to send, which is these dark days are over, right? They want to hit the reset button, maybe get out of the headlines a little bit, and you know repair some of the damage to the brand. So he says he's looking for a chairman. Travis says he wants a more active role. Travis is obviously very emotional about this whole the way this is all unfolded. Do you think that person could be Travis? For now, I would say no. I mean, I do think, you know, the board approved an independent chairperson, mm -hmm. which would be someone outside the company. So they would have to reverse themselves there. So I think, what kind of role could Travis take on? I mean, I think advisor doesn't need to be, I mean, I think advisor could be the role for now. Mm -hmm. um, it's not clear if he'll get anything more than that uh, sort of. At and remember, this is still all tied up in litigation, right? The other news today is that the lawsuit that Benchmark, an early investor, has filed against Travis is moving to arbitration. It's a somewhat of a victory for Travis. He, that's where he wanted this to be resolved. But, you know, his status on the board and the status of two board seats he controls is still very much in question. So, you know, pending the outcome of that, I think we're going to see what kind of influence he will retain on the board and operationally. Let's talk about this suit moving into private arbitration. He was asking for it to be dismissed, which it was not. Um, Shervin Pishavar, another er early Uber investor, released a letter today and actually was in Delaware to speak with the court. Um, and bear with me, I just want to read a couple it's of fun. snippets. I can see why, you know, yeah. He's coming in on the side of Travis, um, saying that we're swimming in the crucible of one of the grandest business and moral battles of our 
generation, we write with the souls of thousands of lives saved, the lives of millions of jobs created, liberating multitudes of drivers from the shackles of servitude to iniquitous taxi cartels of corrupt cabals that choke cities with their pollution of air and morals. Glad I got all that out. I'm going to do a like, Shakespearean uh, performance no. after this. Um, what's going on here? <laughs> I, I, I think Shervin, you know, good friend of Travis's, wants to so show his absolute support here, is a man of a lot of passion, and is sort of communicating in his own way that, you know, Travis has done a lot of good by creating Uber, which he sees as sort of a public utility that's broken up the taxi cab coalitions and all that. So I think he's just trying to frame in sort of perhaps over <laughs> dramatic, dramatic language. The, pro uh, <laughs> the problem is that not only is the writing somewhat overinflated, <laughs> but it comes at a terrible time, yeah. right? Because this was a day about unity, and he's drawing more attention to the divisions that still are there. So it just feels a little tone So down. what's the strategy? Is there a strategy here? Well, I mean, I think he's trying to muster public support for what, what he sees as a, you know, divide, a, still a divided board. But you know, it's, it, it doesn't really make the argument all that persuasively. What do you make of the 18 to 36 months time frame for an IPO? 18 months is a, is a bit sooner than we would have thought, right? Yeah, I think one of our columnists was joking. It's like, it's near enough to say that it's possible that someday we'll go on an IPO, but who knows? I mean, it's just so far away, it's hard for people to really get their heads around and take too seriously. So I think it's almost a nothing statement that sounds sort of serious and professional. I mean, this is a company that's still growing very quickly, but it's losing, what was it, 600 million a quarter? 645. Yeah. Right. So, you know, he's got a lot of strategic decisions to make uh, where he wants to grow, where he wants to pull back. Are these ancillary businesses like Uber Eats and Uber Rush, how much are they going to invest in those? And so with this statement, I think he's just buying himself some time to get the ship in order, to put off the pressure of liquidity that the early investors and the employees have. I think right now this is just the proverbial kind of Heisman stiff arm <laughs> to give himself some time right. while he figures out what's going on. And there's been some reports about new hires, uh, but it seems to be like nothing is set in stone yet. But, you know, there's a chance he could bring in a whole new set of top people, right? He needs to hire a lot of positions, a CFO, a COO, a general counsel, a chief marketing officer, I list them here every day. So it's a <laughs> vacant sort of leadership ranks. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's, it doesn't seem like something's necessarily imminent on that front in terms of Uber bringing somebody on. All right, we will keep watching. I know you will both keep us informed. Thank you, Eric Newcomer, Brad Stone of Bloomberg Tech. Thank you both. All right, coming up, another Bloomberg scoop on the next iPhone. Will it, we will tell you what trick CEO Tim Cook may have up his sleeve when he gets on stage next month. This is Bloomberg. The global music business is set for a major boom, and it is all thanks to streaming services. The industry is set to hit revenues of $41 billion by 2030, with $34 billion of that coming from streaming services, this according to a new forecast by Goldman Sachs. The total number of subscribers is predicted to reach 847 million people by 2030, an increase of more than 700 million people compared to the end of last year. The report also says that Universal Music and Sony Music will benefit heavily from this outlook. Well, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the launch of the iPhone, and it looks like Apple has big plans for its newest model. Last week, Bloomberg was the first to report on several features of the new iPhone, including 3D facial recognition technology to unlock the phone with your face. And now we've got a new scoop, of course. Uh, Apple is planning to eliminate the concept of a home button on its flagship device. This according to images of the new device viewed by Bloomberg News and people familiar with the gadget. The move would mark the biggest interface change in the iPhone's 10-year history. Joining us now are Bloomberg tech reporter Mark Gurman. And you saw these images. What did you see? Saw some pretty cool stuff. I think <laughs> iPhone users are going to be very excited uh, about this new phone. Obviously, they've been working on this phone for a very long time, trying to add a bunch of new features to really make a big splash to the product's 10-year anniversary. The biggest change, they're getting rid of the home button. And it's not going to be a virtual home button. It's going to be an entirely new system based around gestures and thumb controls. So the, the home button's actually staying on the 7 Plus, or at least we think of what we call the 7 Plus or 7S Plus. Right. So Whatever it's not completely going yeah. away yet. Right. So there's going to be three new phones. 
two of them are going to have the general design of the current phones, the 7 and 7 Plus, the same screens, and they will have those physical home buttons. So the big changes are happening on the premium higher end third model. All right, we're actually getting some headlines about who will be replacing Dara Khosrowshahi at Expedia. Mark Okerstrom will be coming uh, CEO of Expedia as Dara Khosrowshahi moves on to take the CEO position at Uber. Uh, Kosher Shahi is actually going to stay on the Expedia board. Obviously, he's been there now for many years. Um, we will bring you more headlines as we have them. So, back to Apple. <laughs> In addition to the home button, what else did you see? I know there's some design changes, the corners, the screen is taller. Right, so I think what one people, what, what some people don't get is that the new iPhone is going to be significantly taller. It's really going to be able to fit much more content. So you'll see more of text message conversations, more of maps, web pages, other applications from the App Store. So it's a big change to the screen as well. So talk to us about what's going on with Toshiba and the chip unit and Apple's interest in that unit. Sure, Apple's always looking for a new way to get components for both the lowest cost and in the highest quantity. They've done so many deals over the years in order to get as much, you know, it's called NAND chips. That's what powers the, the storage for iPhones, iPads, some of their newer Mac laptops and other devices. So it's a absolutely critical component uh, to the iPhone just as a screen or a cellular reception modem is critical. So they want to be able to get as many of those and obviously Toshiba uh, does great work on NAND chips. What does this mean for Apple in terms of performance and supply chain issues? Probably means little in terms of performance because a lot of the NAND chip suppliers are pretty much on par in terms of storage capacities and speed. However, having more suppliers gives them more leverage. All right, uh, and do we know anything more about when we're going to be seeing this new phone in person? Yes, uh, mid-September is uh, what we understand is going to be the plan to release this new phone or to announce the new phone. All right, I'll be excited for all the details to come from you. Until then, uh, Mark German, our Bloomberg Tech reporter, thanks so much. All right, coming up, consumers of the new iPhone aren't the only ones excited for the launch. We talk up to the CEO of one of Apple's key semiconductor suppliers next. This is Bloomberg. Toyota is aiming to nab a bigger slice of the ride-sharing market. The Japanese automaker is investing an undisclosed amount in Southeast Asia's leading ride-hailing service, Grab. Toyota's investment in Grab will be through the $55 million Next Technology Fund set up in April. That fund, created by Tokyo, to Toyota Susho, is seeking opportunities in innovative technology products and services. Last year, Toyota bought a small stake in industry leader Uber, while Grab pulled in $2 billion in investments from Didi and SoftBank. Well, we just discussed details about Apple's eagerly awaited 10th anniversary iPhone, but it is not just consumers that are brimming with excitement. Suppliers are equally as giddy as they look towards new business opportunities with the Apple supply chain. Our very own Caroline Hyde spoke with the CEO of one of the key semiconductor suppliers to Apple, based in Europe. Caroline, take it away. Emily, thank you. Yes, I spoke with Dialog Semiconductor CEO Jalal Balgerli. Now, he said new phones coming to the market help spell an exciting second half of 2017 for the company. We also began our conversation with, well, his outlook for growth in the mobile business. Take a listen. The mobile industry is probably growing a lot less than what it used to, um, but I think in any market of this size you'll always find uh, pockets of growth um, because there are new things that happen or new geographies that uh, join the, uh, the market. Uh, so for us, I think given this, the huge size of this market worldwide, there's always uh, areas that we can identify some pockets of growth and position ourselves. Talk to us about the geographical layout of that because I'm hearing India, I'm hearing China, these have really been the areas that many of the mobile and phone makers have been positioning in and likewise is this something that as the the unit maker you have to be in as well so we work with the um, uh, OEM manufacturers and uh, and to your point uh, so North America and Europe is fairly saturated so majority of the business is replacement with the new products and they have to be really exciting to uh, ex you know to uh, stimulate demand but uh, on the other hand in many of the emerging uh, markets like uh, China in the last few years, but now more and more India, and I think other areas of Latin America, Middle East, there's, there's still plenty of growth 
uh, as the uh, smartphone sort of uh, pervades the uh, the use uh, across the world. So, so, so those companies, for example, we were working with companies that primarily used to focus on North America or China. Now they started exporting to Southeast Asia and India as well, and uh, that's how our chips get uh, used. Your chips in the mobile phone players of course immediately spring to mind you're talking about ex potentially exciting new phones that are going to come on the market one of your big companies that you supply to is of course apple are you excited about the launch of the new iphone 8 how much is there dependent on this new product um well you know we uh, have been a supplier to uh, this very very successful company for a number of years and uh, along with uh, all the other suppliers you know we will watch this space and and, and see um what the new uh, products are like and and you know what they decide to use uh, but we've guided in in end of our uh, q2 for for an exciting q3 q4 growth and typically the pre-Christmas, uh, there's a lot of new new products gets launched that use our chips. So we we we're really looking forward to uh, to the second half of this year. So how much do you think your revenue will eventually be dependent on the mobile? So mobile as a market is is very very large. So um, I think that always be a dominant part of our revenue and uh, is a very concentrated uh, market as well. The, the five or six uh, major guys in, in that market have majority of the revenue. So that creates concentration that people talk about is actually a facet of that market. So if you are successful, you have to be a concentrated player um, uh, to a large extent. But there are other emerging markets markets in terms of uh, IoT, in terms of uh, more electronics in cars, so it's not sort of traditional automotive but more new automotive uh, in terms of um, uh, beyond the dashboard into um, self-driving uh, and uh, LiDAR and other, other uh, technologies that come on the scene. And that creates more requirement for electronics chips and electronics technology to be used. It sounds as though diversification is there. Are we seeing a diversification away from Apple as well? I look on the supply chain function of Bloomberg, it still says 70% of your revenue comes from this one particular phone maker. Right. We've seen what's happened to imagination technologies. How do you ensure that the same future isn't painted for yourselves? So we, we're taking steps in, in both diversifying within customers and diversifying with other customers. So and we are making progress on, on both fronts. So we are in more than phones, we are in tablets, we are in watches, we are in uh, notebooks. Uh, so that's one way of diversifying. So you're not dependent on one source of revenue. And the other thing is the activity that we've started in China in the past uh, three, four years. It started to bear uh, fruits, so we have partnerships in addition to uh, touching pretty much all the top names in China like Huawei, like Vivo, like Xiaomi and Oppo. We also uh, have started a partnership with a uh, chipset manufacturer in China where we complement their chips. So we provide the power, they provide the digital chips for mobile phone, for tablets and they call Spectrum which is the biggest uh, mobile chipset maker in China. And through them we can access a whole tiers of smaller customers, second tier customers that we as a small company out of Europe Europe will not have as much access to. So those are part of the things that we've uh, put in place to ensure we have diversity in our growth. And lastly, many people see you as a German listed company, but you're UK headquartered. How is the current political situation? You are someone who came from Iran to the United Kingdom. Right. This must be something that's close to your heart as well as to your business, that immigration is something that is being looked at. How is it changing the way in which Dialogue Semiconductor orchestrates itself here when we are in a process of coming out of the EU? Well, I mean, we're very uh, much um, an international company. We are headquartered in the UK and we're very proud of that. So we're based out of uh, our uh, headquarters in Reading. Uh, the company started originally in the UK and is a PLC, as you uh, mentioned. We are listed for historical reasons on, on Frankfurt Stock Exchange. So we will watch with interest to see how the uh, evolution of uh, Brexit works and what it means in terms of uh, regulations in different areas for us. To date, though, there has not been a lot of impact so far um, and you know we'll watch along with many other international companies how that potentially affect the attraction of talent for example to the UK so those are the areas that uh, we would be watching to to see how that evolves
world. But outside of that, today we conduct business all the way around the world and being in or out of uh, EU per se, I don't think would, uh, would matter to us much. And where do you build your next design center then? Where's the talent coming from? Um, I think that uh, it is likely to be in Asia. Um, so we will continue to add talent to our locations in Europe, in the UK. Um, but in, in reality, in terms of the number of engineers we need, we have to build potentially a design center in India. That was my conversation with Dialogue Semiconductor's CEO, Jalal Bagheli. Emily. All right, Caroline Hyde in London. Thanks so much. All right, just to recap our breaking news, Expedia has named its CFO, Mark Okerstrom, as its new CEO. The company quickly filling the job after Dara Khosrowshahi unexpectedly quit to join Uber. Okerstrom just tweeted out that he is honored to lead the world's greatest travel and tech company through the next exciting chapter. He's been working at Expedia since 2011. Coming up, we speak to the CEO of a leading cybersecurity company, Symantec. How the business is faring in the wake of the recent high-profile WannaCry and Petya breaches? This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. During a visit to Springfield, Missouri to outline his tax reform plan, President Trump began his remarks by commending the emergency responders dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. To those who survived and lost homes and loved ones, the president said, we will be with you every single day after to restore, recover, and rebuild. Texas Governor Greg Abbott said the rains from Harvey have moved east from the Houston area to the region around Beaumont, Texas, and he warned, quote, the worst is not yet over for the southeast. While we are dealing with uh, what is now receding waters in Harris County uh, and the ongoing uh, evacuation uh, as, as well as uh, safety rescue process in Harris County, we're now also dealing with uh, catastrophic conditions uh, in southeast Texas. At a United Nations disarmament forum in Geneva, Switzerland, a member of South Korea's defense ministry said the international community must collect, quote, strength and wisdom to deal with North Korea. North Korea's nuclear and missile threats are not just a threat to us, but a direct threat to your people who may be staying in or in the vicinity of the Korean Peninsula. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 7.30 Thursday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Well, we're seeing Nikkei futures uh, traded out of Chicago higher by four tenths of one percent as the market in Japan waits on industrial production numbers for July, and that's expected to contract a little, about a third of one percent. Uh, here in Australia, ASX futures looking fl pretty flat, just up one point at the moment. And about an hour's time, we'll have the Treasurer Scott Morrison uh, delivering the Bloomberg address here in Sydney. You'll be able to watch that on Live Go. Uh, China's major banks will be in focus today after the four biggest banks all be estimates uh, for second quarter net income by curbing bad loans and uh, being propelled by improved growth in China. Just take a look at a couple of them. Bank of China second quarter net income up 23 percent to $8.7 billion. ICBC meanwhile up to $11.7 billion for the quarter. Also watching Bank of Korea rate decision out today expected to stay on hold at one and a quarter percent. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Symantec has released new research on global ransomware threats. The annual report provides a comprehensive look back at the key ransomware attacks and trends from this year so far, including the arrival of the new generation of self-propagating threats like WannaCry, which affected more than 150 countries and over 200,000 people. One key finding, during the first six months of 2017, businesses accounted for 42% of all ransomware infections. Joining us now to discuss some of the key findings, Symantec CEO Greg Clark. Greg, great to have you back with hey, us. Emily, thank you so very much. So what were the highlights well, of I, the latest report? You know, I think the, uh, the effect of ransomware is uh, Definitely with us, as we saw from WannaCry and, and Petya. Mm -hmm. I think the average price settling in the $500 per infection range. Right. I think really interestingly, uh, you know, tools for making uh, this kind of ransomware have emerged. Mm -hmm. We found one in China mm -hmm. that's made for criminals by criminals mm -hmm. that allows them to mint ransomware uh, attacks for Android and. Uh, participate in the, in the financing, so something we really care about. So the demands have actually experienced some inflation, right? The price is yeah. going up in terms of price what these guys up. are asking, asking yeah. for. Absolutely. We, we think that you know this kind of stuff is going to be with us for a long time. More than just crypto locking computers, it may be things that are extortion related, mm -hmm. but something that consumers and businesses will need to care about for a long time. So what do you think when you look at the cyber landscape right now? Obviously things are moving quickly. What is, what is the biggest threat? So, you know, I think the threats are broad, broad based. You know, there's definitely an easy way to make money through ransomware. There's also still a, a massive plague in identity theft. This is still something that's, that's with us all across the world. Mm -hmm. And I think really, you know, protecting your identity, making sure that you have uh, services that alert you about your identity being stolen, the protection of your credit is important. And then there's also the huge proliferation in the home for consumers around IoT devices that are doing bad things, mm -hmm. emanating from the house. And I think this is another uh, crisis that we have to be careful of uh, right across the globe. Now, Symantec has been making a lot of acquisitions. Some say the company yep. is basically going through a complete makeover. What is yep. the actual integration strategy? What does that look like? What's that look like? Yeah, so you know, we made two really big, trans really big transformational acquisitions, Blue Coat uh, on the enterprise side and LifeLock for identity protection on the consumer side. Those have gone extremely well, and as we've been, uh, we've been uh, uh, reporting on those in our, in, our, in our quarterly calls, I think you know, our consumer business has gone very well. We had period compare, we'd been down 8% in our consumer revenue after LifeLock. We were up 1%, mm -hmm. same period, as uh, very strong results. And we just did two other small acquisitions, one called Fireglass. This is focusing on the area of isolation. This is a topic where we don't let the bad code or the bad malware get to your endpoint or get to your server, it runs in the cloud very powerful technology and then the other one SkyCure which really brings us up to best in class on all the mobile platforms. And you have just finished a trip around the world and you're seeing some emerging trends that really change the cybersecurity landscape. Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah I just came back from uh, I just circumnavigated to the mm -hmm. globe in the last few days <laughs> so I just got off the plane from New Delhi. So well, thanks for coming I, in. That was very good. So I think a couple of, uh, of things you know some of the uh, economies are out in APAC are moving to a cashless economy big digitization uh, efforts in their society. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in, in India now, you have a, your bank account on your phone and, and you can do all your e-commerce and things like that in, in a very emerging economy. The attack surface increase is massive, where you have the ability to get at banking and get at payments on a phone. You have a lot of criminal activity. So I think, you know, this is, uh, this is something I think is, is uh, going to play globally for, for quite some time. And the security environment in the light of the Petcha and want to cry breaches what is demand like demand your i think demand is fantastic you know we're seeing uh, demand in consumers is is on the, on the rise and in the enterprise it's great you know and in, in even even in emerging markets like in in india we just had uh, launched a, a service with airtel right to bring all of the cyber defense capabilities to their customers mm -hmm. That was, you know, those those conferences were packed. The follow-up was amazing. Mm -hmm. So definitely, we were in a situation of a strong pipeline build. All right, Brad Clark, CEO of Symantec, giving us the cyber landscape update. Thanks so much Thank you very for stopping much. by, fresh off the plane. Thank you. Thank you. All right. PayPal is turning to the physical world to help extend its reach in the digital world. It's introducing a credit card that offers customers 2% cash back on purchases with no annual fee. The move is part of CEO Dan Schulman's effort to transform PayPal from a payments button on websites into a financial tool used in brick and mortar stores. He's forged 24 deals over the last 18 months with companies including Apple, Visa, and JP Morgan. 
Coming up, VMware's roster of cloud computing partnerships grows. My conversation with CEO Pat Gelsinger next. This is Bloomberg. VMware, the cloud computing company that falls under the Dell Technologies umbrella, announced several new partnerships with the likes of Google and Amazon Web Services from the company's annual conference in Las Vegas. I sat down with VMware CEO Pat Gelsinger at the event for an exclusive interview and asked how current partners reacted to the latest cloud partnerships. We have those conversations, we update them, we want no surprises because we're trying to be very, very you know, thoughtful in our relationships uh, with them. And clearly Amazon says, well, this work on the Amazon service that we just did. You know, IBM, you know, they're also uh, working and partnered with Pivotal in that community. So we go through all of those discussions because it's real important to us, just like you would. You know, I mean, you think about these partnerships like friendships. Mm -hmm. You know, while, hey, you know, I may do some things that you didn't necessarily want me to do, but let me explain to you, I don't want to surprise you. I want to see, and, and maybe there's even opportunities for us to work together in different ways as a result of this. And that's how we really approach working with our ecosystem partners. So does the frenemy term apply here? Well, in this case, we just say it's all friends. <laughs> okay. So are you at all concerned that this partnership with Amazon, for example, could lead to them stealing your business? Uh, absolutely not. And, you know, if you think about it, you know, and several have asked that question, and, you know, customers, if they wanted to just move to the Amazon service, they would have, right? You know, it's not like the Amazon service just appeared yesterday. You know, it's been around for a decade plus now. And what customers have found, Emily, is that to re-platform my application, it is hard and it doesn't like give me a whole lot of value. You know, yesterday I had the app, tomorrow I have the app running in an Amazon cloud. I had to put a lot of work to get it there. That's the problem that we're solving because we're going to customers and saying you can now take advantage of cloud scale, cloud geography, cloud economics without replatforming the application. And in many cases, these applications that we're now bringing to the cloud, you know, they might have been curated for 20 years, 30 years, you know, as they've built those and complex networks, security, management, and we now give them the easy button. So, you know, Amazon's excited about this because they've heard that from their customers too. It's been about a year since the big merger closed, the biggest tech deal in history. What's it been like for you under the Dell Technologies umbrella, the high points and the pain points? Yeah, and you know, when we announced the merger and Michael and I got on stage, I said three words describe independent, ecosystem, and acceleration. Independent, we're an independent company. We're governed by the board, you know, Dell, Silver Lake, they happen to be our largest shareholder. But so I, Michael doesn't bug you too, too much, is that what you're saying? Of course he bugs me a lot. He's <laughs> the chairman of my board, but I'm managed by the board, and it really is the multiplicity of the board. You know, he was committed to our independent ecosystem, and he's going to accelerate his business with us. So we said a billion dollars of synergy. Now, you know, clearly the independence that's working just great. You know, the board is happy. Obviously, when the company is doing well, boards are happy. That's wonderful. Ecosystem. Think about the partnerships that we've announced. IBM, Amazon, the HP announcement we, we announced this week. All of those are not necessarily in Dell, the traditional view of Dell's best interest. But Michael says if it's good for VMware, it's good for Dell Technologies. So we're clearly seeing the ecosystem is being supported. And then finally, we raised our guidance for the acceleration. Uh, last quarter we did that. So overall, we're seeing them sell more of our products and build more new products together. So overall, you know, we're exceeding the expectations that we had a year ago when we announced the deal. How is the networking business doing? Is it still growing as rapidly? Are you seeing meaningful competition from Cisco. Networking is going great for us. You know, we're really seeing NSX and you know the vision I laid out for it here is really bold in the sense that it isn't just in the data center or more, but between data centers, between clouds, across any clouds, we're stretching it to uh, be IoT and into the core service provider network. Today's announcement into next generation container, we're really viewing it, you know, as this common fabric that connects all of these things together, turning data centers 
into centers of data that have this connection across everywhere they go. So going very well. You know, the relationship with Cisco, you know, they you know, continue to you know, view this, boy, you know, that networking layer, but you know, we're in this hardware business and what we're finding is customers are running a lot of our overlay networking on their hardware. And that's okay, you know, it works great, we support them, maybe half of our customers uh, run it that way. But our vision for where we're taking NSX is much bigger, much broader than any traditional view of networking, and that's why it's a really thrilling uh, uh, period for what we're doing in NSX and that business overall. And just a last question about security, I know you've unveiled a new security product. You know, how concerned are you at the level of threats uh, that we're seeing from cyberspace? Will the industry ever be able to really get ahead. Yeah, and as I declared in my keynote uh, on Monday, I says, I think we, the tech industry, have failed our customers in security. You know, we have almost 2,000 uh, different companies in security. You know, mind-boggling innovations going on, but there's so many point products sort of that are, mm -hmm. you know, as we would call it, chasing bad. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is think holistically in a very different way to solve the security uh, dilemma. And we call it enforcing good. Mm -hmm. So we announced some new products that are, you know, App Defense is one of those uh, in particular. But we said three things that we need to do to fundamentally change the game in security. One is it's not about infrastructure. Infrastructure must uh, essentially eliminate many of those products and make it secure infrastructure. Literally, products and companies go away, they disappear into the infrastructure. You know, you, you can't turn it off, it is always secure. Second, we must integrate into the core security ecosystem and automate, integrate, validate, so customers aren't trying to put all these pieces together, we've done it for them. And third, enable consistent cyber hygiene. You know, and uh, we've been real involved with the uh, U.S. government, we had you know, Representative Eshu and Senator Hatch, you know, talk about cyber hygiene. They're introducing legislation. We laid out our five cyber hygiene principles that if you would do these things, you would not be Sony OPM target. You know, those, the surface area of those would have been radically reduced, if not eliminated. And, you know, sort of like a great sports team, you practice the basics. And if people were practicing the basics and implementing these things consistently and well, we think we'd eliminate a large portion, maybe 80 or 90% of all uh, cyber uh, losses would be eliminated. So, you know, we believe this is the right way to think about security in the future. We VMware are stepping forward in a much bolder way in this regard, partnering with Dell and our ecosystem. It's time to change the game on cybersecurity. All right, VMware CEO Pat Gelsinger there. Well, a recent filing by Berkshire Hathaway showed that the company reduced its stake in IBM. Berkshire trimming its position from about 64 million shares to 54 million. This comes as IBM stock has fallen more than 14% this year. Bloomberg's David Weston spoke with Berkshire's chairman and CEO Warren Buffett about his investment in IBM. I've made lots of mistakes, David. Uh, that's part of the game. I mean, there is no way in the investment business. Somebody says to you they never made a mistake. You know, check them out. Uh, uh, but that was a fairly large uh, commitment. And uh, I would say that uh, the competition. What's really fascinating to me, actually, is what what Amazon did with the cloud. I mean, here is a company that you don't even think of as being in that business six or seven years ago. And, and Jeff Bezos has really taken something, like you wouldn't have thought they'd be doing that. Uh, and, and from a standing start, uh, and he has even said on Charlie Rose, he was amazed at how much runway he was given. But here are a bunch of very smart people in the tech industry around him, and not just IBM, but you know Microsoft, Google, you name it, I mean, uh, the people. And uh, uh, they let they all of them have a big lead, and you don't want to let a smart fellow have a big lead. <laughs> <laughs> Bloomberg's David Weston there speaking with Berkshire Half the Way Chairman and CEO, the one and only Warren Buffett. Coming up, after a big push for diversity in tech this year, where does it stand for those just entering the field? We'll speak with Code.org CEO Hadi Partovi next. This is Bloomberg. Well, there has been impressive growth in computer science participation in U.S. education. This according to 
code.org. In just four years, the organization has gone, gone from zero students to 20 million accounts on the platform today. Joining me right now, uh, code.org CEO and founder, Hadi Partovi. Hadi, great to have you back here on the show. So it's back to school season, and you guys have made incredible progress uh, in just the last four years. I know you were, you were on the show when you launched it. Uh, talk to us about where the organization is today and what that means. Sure. Code.org's mission is that every school should teach computer science so that every student has the opportunity to learn it. Uh, and the, the opportunity to learn computer science shouldn't be determined based on you know, the color of the, your skin or the neighborhood you live in. Uh, when we started, only about 10% of schools taught computer science. We're now at almost 40% of schools, which is a huge change in US education. And the number of students learning computer science, especially girls and underrepresented minorities, has just exploded. Uh, and what we're so excited about today is to talk about the AP computer science exam, which is the advanced placement exam. It's a college level course that is being now taught in high schools that never taught computer science before. And both girls and unrepresented minorities are flocking to this exam at a, at a, and to this course at a pace that's never been seen before. Give us some of the numbers. How much progress are you seeing among girls in particular? So Code.org, you mentioned, has 20 million students on its platform. Nine million of those are girls. It's almost 50-50. Which is an incredible thing. Nine million girls is is huge compared to the, the entire software industry has about 250,000 women in it. We have nine million kids who are all women learning from grades K through 12. And what about underrepresented minorities? Among underrepresented minorities, 48 percent of our students are underrepresented minorities. So that's almost 10 million. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure these are these are kids who are taking classes just like they would take math, right? How do you make sure they they stay engaged, right? How many of those? will actually lead to jobs in the industry? Well, we teach computer science not just for the jobs. We teach it because you, know, you learned biology when, when you went to school, not because you became a biologist or you learn how electricity works and you're not an electrician. In today's age, everybody should learn the basics of algorithms and apps and how the internet works. Uh, but among our students, 70% of them say they want to study computer science after they graduate from high school. So that's going to make a huge difference given there's so many more in the K-12 system now than the traditional workforce. You have started several companies in your life. You've worked at tech companies. I'm curious what you thought of the memo from James Damore, the Google engineer, very controversial, where he argued that there are biological reasons that there is an underrepresentation of women in tech and in leadership. What did you think about that? Um, I had a number of thoughts. Uh, you know, whether he said it or not, I've heard a lot of people then ask me since then, is there any difference between girls and boys in terms of learning to code? There's strong research that shows that there isn't a genetic difference in terms of the ability to learn computer science. There may be other differences that make it harder for women to work in a tech workplace, but it's certainly not a difference in their ability to, to, to learn how to do this stuff. But I have an eight-year-old daughter, and I challenge anybody to bring an eight-year-old boy to, to, <laughs> to, to challenge her to coding and see who does better. Uh, I do think there's a huge cultural problem in our, in our society around the differences between men and women and making it comfortable for women to, to succeed in the tech space. Which brings me to you know, what's going on in the industry. Obviously, we have the James Damore story. We have many stories about sexism and sexual harassment that have been coming out of you know, the venture capital industry, also what's happening at Uber. How much do you think the industry and these issues affect the pipeline, affect whether young girls want to continue studying computer science, whether or not they can do it. It's really important to, to them. You know, young girls in high school, they read the news too. They see what's happening, especially if they're in a computer science class. Uh, and in fact, in Code.org's classrooms, we actually talk about diversity. We prepare the teachers to raise these issues, to prepare the, 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 you know, the growing female workforce in tech to know how to be ready for this environment. Uh, but we need we need all stages of this pipeline to change in the K through 12 space, which is what we do in the university level, and the corporations need to adjust their culture. Right. So, as well. what is Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley's role in well, changing the education? Well, one big part is a lot of Silicon Valley funds Code.org. <laughs> Companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon—they're all funding Code.org. Mm -hmm. And so, to the extent you expect them to do something about their diversity problem. The fact that our classrooms are 45% female, a lot of that is thanks to the work of these companies. At, and they also need to do the work to make sure that their internal culture goes through the unconscious bias training, you know, right. hiring practices, all those practices to be more fair. All right. Hadi Partovi of Code.org. Great work you guys are doing. Thanks so much Thank you, uh, for stopping by and sharing that update.
That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. This Thursday, we will bring you a special devoted to cryptocurrencies. It's a $150 billion industry and one of the biggest investing plays of the year. This is Bloomberg.